book of 1 Samuel, Samuel the prophet. Prophetess Melissa sends her love. I talked to her earlier. And I don't know if you all heard the story. She uh, was, had minor surgery this year and died on the doctor's table and was dead for, I think she, they said something like seven, eight minutes. And uh, they were able to revive her. She had a supernatural experience. She's still in recovery. And, uh, powerful testimony. The doctor didn't think he was going to be able to re re pull her out. Her blood pressure rapidly dropped and, uh, and her sister was there. You know Bernadette, her sister travels with her. And Bernadette and a couple of women just went to praying and uh, they heard the, the nurse come out and say, uh, your sister just died on the operating table. We're trying to resuscitate or whatever. And she just began to holler Jesus and pray and, he, and God miraculously healed Melissa and now she's, uh, she's up and running and they said it was going to take two years before she'd be able to sing and do any ministry. She's going to be singing at the Azusa Conference. She's up and already they call her the miracle woman. Doctors are getting converted and nurses are getting delivered and said it's an awesome, awesome testimony. So, and uh, she's coming, she's got a fresh anointing on her and uh, I'm just excited about that. So it's really, uh, so she sends her love to all of you all as well because she's the one that introduced me to y'all and uh, with her sister and her crazy self, we love her, amen. The book of 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, very familiar passage of scripture, uh, but I want to look at, at a couple of things. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shokoh, which belongs to Judah, and pitched between Shokoh and Azekah in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in the array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head and was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye the servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall you be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all of Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of the Ephratite of Bethlehem Judah whose name was Jesse and he had eight sons and the man went among men for an old man in the days of Israel and the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle and the names of the three sons that went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn the next unto him Abinadab and the third Shammah and David was the youngest and the three eldest followed Saul and David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem and the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. I want to draw my text from the 12th verse, the first two ver words. Now, David. That's what I want to preach on tonight. Now, David. If we approach the book of 1 Samuel and its writing and... Those of you that were English majors or have any literary sense, dealing with the text would see an obvious break with proper writing. It is understood by most scholars, give me a few moments, I'm going somewhere. It is understood by most scholars that some texts are added later to better clarify uh, certain situations. So scholars agree that when Samuel had written his letter or when Samuel was writing this particular book this historical event that 
he includes or adds the 12th verse or the 12th verse as a footnote it's there it doesn't follow the continuity of the text one moment the writer is talking about the philistine and saul's armies and then immediately in the midst of this discussion he is interrupted and he gives his footnote about this young man by the name of david and says now david son of the Ephratite of Bethlehem of Judah, Jesse's son. Uh, he, he gives this whole little history and then shares who he was and where he came from. Out of nowhere, David is introduced. Out of nowhere, out of this event that's about to take place, David interrupts Samuel's train of thought. It opens up with the word now. Now is a very important word, especially as we understand it in the prophetic sense because whatever God does he does it now uh, the future is not a relevant event for God and most of us live in the future or we're always worried about the future and regretting the past and we don't really understand that the only t thing that is important to God is the now because God moves in the now and God works in the now and the future and the past are God's now where we're going God already is and where we've been God still is so that God is connected to everything. So what we are trying to get, as far as God is concerned, we already have. And where we're trying to go, as far as God is concerned, we are already there. See, Jesus didn't die 2,000 years ago. Jesus died before the foundation of the world. See, for God, he didn't need an event. An event simply was uh, something that, that, that took place in time, but God lives outside of time. God is not limited by time. Time was created by God and for God they were not created time was not it's not the prison of God we are the prisoners of time but God is not the prisoner of time now then becomes an eternal sense because the only time that is actually eternal is now it will always be now and the future will eventually become your past so the future cannot be eternal because my future will eventually be my past are you with me but my future will be now and my now is now. See, wherever I am, it will always be now. Now can't be captured. Now can't be described. You can't take a picture of now because if you took a picture of now and developed it, by the time it was developed, now wouldn't be now. If you try to tell someone about now, by the time you told them, it would already be your past. So now is not something that you can actually describe. It's something you got to live in. This is why faith doesn't work in the future. You can't believe for. You got to believe now. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Jesus Jesus says that the hour cometh and now is. See, is it coming or is it now? It sounds like it is a paradox, probably even a contradiction. But spiritual people understand that what most people are waiting for, those who walk in a realm of faith do not have to wait to apprehend because what other people are trying to get, they already have. Now, the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers will worship me in spirit and in truth. See, some people got to wait to get there, but those who walk by faith can operate from that divine provision right now. Are you listening to me? So now is an absolutely vital, important, thriving word in the scripture because when we understand that, that God moves, that time is really a figment of our imagination, it is an unnecessary thing and has nothing to do with what God is doing because God lives on the other side of time. God created time and watches time. He watches all times at the same time. What's going to happen as far as he's concerned has already happened. He does not see time in a progressive pattern. He sees it all at one moment moment as a fine painting that he is enjoys he sees it all taking place simultaneously this is why when John wrote the book of Revelation he didn't write it in future tense he wrote it in present tense though it is an eschatological text and deals with the future as far as John was concerned when John was caught up in the spirit he left time he was on his body was on the Isle of Patmos but he said I was in the spirit on the Lord's day see the Lord's day is different than your day the Lord's day is all day the Lord's day is every day. The Lord's day is every day, past, present, and future. So when John was caught up into the Lord's day, he ceased to live in this day. And when John said, I, John, saw a beast rising up out of the, out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon each head was the name of blasphemy. Upon each horn was a crown. And then he had, he had you know, this, he describes it, but not future. This is not what's going to happen. This is what is happening. He says, I, John, saw the city, New Jerusalem, coming out of heaven. Saw, past tense. How could you see it? And it hasn't come yet. You're standing right there now, John. John said, because you, you're dealing with an issue of time. 
He says, when I left the earth realm, I entered into timelessness. This is why Moses, when Moses went and began to uh, talk to a bush that was burning and began to deal with an issue of the burning bush, and the Bible says that the bush was on fire, but it was not consumed by the fire. Why was that so important? Because it takes time. If, I, if you light something on fire, what causes the fire to devour something is time. Fire needs time to destroy it. But if God was present in the bush, it was eternal, so the fire couldn't consume the bush, could not consume it because it was in eternity. Are you getting this? This is why when Moses said, look, God, I want to see your glory. I want to see your face. God said, I can't show you my face because if you see my face, you're going to see the future. But I'll show you my hinder parts. And that's why Moses could write the hinder parts was the past. It was what God did. So Moses could write the book of Genesis in the first person, even though Moses wasn't there because when he saw God's hinder parts, he saw what God did. See, what God did was a present reality. And when Moses wrote the book of Genesis, he wrote it as if he had been there because he was there. Because when he saw God's hinder parts, he saw the past, which was his now. Are you with me? We have to understand how important that is because everything you're trying to get, that's why most of your prayers aren't answered because you're praying in the wrong spirit. You're praying for. And as long as you're praying for, you are abdicating your present rea re reality to a future moment. And as long as you're believing for something, then you're saying, I don't have it. As long as you believe for it, then you abdicate what you are supposed to have now for the future. So you got to stop believing for and you got to start believing from. There's a difference between you believe for and believe from. I don't believe for stuff. I believe from stuff. I don't fight for the victory. I fight from the victory. The victory is an already established fact. I don't fight demons. They are already defeated. It is my job to remind them of what has already happened. It's my job to let them know that they must have missed the email, but I'm here to tell them. Are you listening to me? So touch somebody and say, now. So the scripture introduces us to a young man by the name of David. And the scripture says, now David. And that's what I want to preach on tonight, now David. In order to better understand David, we have to go into David's past. We have to look at David's introduction. Where does David come from? The scripture says that there's a man that God has raised up from the Benjamites to rule over Israel. First of all, God tells Israel, or Israel tells God, we want a king. God tells him, before I give you a king, let me tell you what a king will do. He says, when you get a king, they're going to take your sons and send them to war. They're going to tax you. They're going to marry your daughters off. They're going to take everything that you own. They want a portion of all that you have. But Israel so wanted to be like the world. They wanted to reflect what they saw as success in other places. One of the things we have to be very careful of in pursuing the things of God that we do not measure our success by the world's standards. One of the things that disturbs me in ministry, I think the greatest disturbing fact in ministry, is that now the greatness of a ministry is determined by its success, by how much money do you bring in, by how many members do you have, by, by what honorariums can you demand, by whether or not uh, you're, what kind of car you drive, or what kind of clothes you wear. And, and, and that's what they determine success. You know you've made it when you're wearing crocodiles and Armani. You know, you know you're anointed now when you, when you can afford to pay for TBN and BET. You know you made it when you're selling this many books and this many tapes and, and you can demand this much money. And, and I, look, I, I got to make a living like the next guy and I like to wear nice things like the next guy but my shoes and my suits and my clothes and my big ring and my big cross none of those things are a sign of my success they are a sign that I got some credit and some money and taste but success in the kingdom is not determined by those things success in the kingdom is determined by the stuff that people never see it is determined by your intimate conversation your prayer life your fasting your dedication your hunger for the word pure pure formation in the sense that you are truly pursuing the things of God it is not what people see on the outside that determines God spoke to me many years ago and told me Braun I will never judge you for what takes place publicly I will judge you for what takes place privately he says your preaching doesn't impress me your prayers prayed when people are listening has never moved me he says what you do in public has never ever impressed me it is what you do when no one is there it is when you pray when no one is listening but me it is when you are reading the 
the word when no one is listening but me it is how you live when nobody sees you it's how you talk when no one's listening to you that is what I judge you for see stop pressing for the things and desiring to be successful by the world standard because you can have all of that and still not be happy you can drive the nicest cars and live in the nicest homes and have the greatest money finances and jobs and still be miserable in your life because the only thing that we are truly hungering for the only thing God has created a vacuum inside of every one of us and that vacuum can only be filled by him and we try to fill it with stuff and we try to fill it with stuff because we are ignoring the real need which David said as the deer pants for the water so doth my soul long for you so we have to be careful to not ignore the longing of our soul the success of a man's ministry is not determined by the crowds that follow him it is determined by the cloud that follows him there is a weight of God's presence a weight of God's glory that the church has omitted we have sought crowds and have neglected the cloud the Bible says that Israel says gives us give us a king and God says I'll give you a king he calls a man by the name of Saul out of the Benjamite tribe Saul is consecrated king I won't deal with all of the prophetic significances because there are so many Saul is anointed king the Bible says Saul goes to defeat the armies of God and in going to defeat the armies of God God says kill everything destroy all of it every animal every sheep every woman every child bring nothing back alive see we don't understand why God gives rules like that because there are, there are spiritual reasons because there are things in our life that we purposely neglect when God commands us to go in and to deal with the issues in our life there are pet things in our life that we don't want to touch and we won't let nobody else touch there are issues in our life that we try to ignore or that we have considered we've made them sacred and if we try to deal with them or try or somebody else tries to kill them immediately we begin we become defensive so when the prophet comes the bible says that first of all the prophet is late understand this every delay in your life is designed to reveal the secrets of your heart Every delay in your life is designed to reveal the secrets in your heart. If you're, if you're believing for something and it's not happening as quick as you want, then what you need to be watching is how your heart is reacting. Because delay will reveal frustration. It will reveal how much, how much you care about, how, much, how committed you are. Delay, you, you, many people backslide because of delay. People quit churches over delays. They should have, I should have been preaching by now. I should have been made an elder by now. See, delay is there to reveal why you're here. You don't pick a church because they're going to make you a leader. You pick a church because you're being fed. I don't understand where this, you know, and, and the, the problem is, is because Pentecostal and charismatic churches don't have seminary programs or most people don't think they should go to them or deal with them or be schooled so that you have to be formed in your church. There's no problem with that. That's all right. So you're formed in the church. But then what happens is everybody that comes to church thinks that they're supposed to be formed and be made a leader. So the church no longer becomes a place of community and a place where we come to be fed and a place of refreshing and a place of prayer and a place of consecration. It's just a stepping stone till I get my own church. Shandai. I made him pay my ticket before I got here. Round trip, just so if, so if y'all trip, I can still get home. So we come to church and we manipulate leadership because we want we want to be in a position. And see, let me help you. The Bible says that a prophet is without honor in his own home. Every great preacher needs a place to come back to where they don't respect him. Every one of you that's called, you need, to be in, you, you, you need to be here in a place where they don't honor you and don't respect you to keep you humble. After you preach to thousands, you need to come back to some place where somebody remember you when you didn't know how to plait your hair and you couldn't afford to sew none in. and You, could, you, you, you didn't even know what, how to match your clothes up and you was wearing stars and stripes and polka dots at the same time. And you wore a hat not because you was cute, but because you couldn't afford to get your hair done. We remember.
You need a place where you are, you are, where you come to be yourself. We neglect that because in the church, more than anything, we play such a game. It makes me sick. God, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. How you doing? Pray. Our voice changes. We can't even talk to each other. When, when you see another saint, you, 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 you have to drop. If you're a man, you drop your voice. If you're a woman, you got to get real. Hallelujah. You got to be, praise the Lord, doctor. How you doing? You can't even speak English. Y'all can't even go to a restaurant and order nothing right. You praise God, praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah, praise the Lord. How is the hamburger? Praise the Lord. Thank you, praise God, hallelujah. Can't even, I say, praise the Lord. Do you, how, can you have, do you have soda, Coca-Cola, hallelujah. And you, do you know that there are, y'all, there are some, how many of you know there are some people like that? Can't even speak English, everything, amen, amen, praise God, amen. I just said hello. <laughs> why? Because we live such a... Uh, because you know why? The church, which should... If there is one place where I should be comfortable being myself. You know, I go to work. I got to get dressed up to deal with these line devils at job. You got to deal with your boss. You got to put a smile on when you don't want to smile. How you doing? Yes, sir. Good to see you too. I'm so happy. Just glad to be here. You got to deal with that. You got to go home to your family, to your kids. You can't let your kids see the struggles you're dealing with, the problems you're dealing with. You got to de- be sure if you're a man, you got to be strong for your wife. Even though you know that the bills are pressing and there are issues, you got to be strong because if you ain't, she going to get on your back. So you got to keep her. Hand. It's all right, baby. I got it covered. And you know in your mind, you're thinking, I'm about to lose everything. We play games with everybody. We play it with family. We play it with our job on the street and with people we deal with. When you go to buy something, you got to walk in there like you got a million dollars. No, you ain't got no money, no credit. You walk in, can I test drive this car? We play the game with everybody, but there, if there's one place that we should be able to come and be ourselves, if there's one place where we should be able to leave everything at the door and just say, look, I'm messed up, folks. Tell the usher, look, I'm having a rough day. I'm going to sit toward the back. You know, I'm, I may get a little loud. You know, just leave me alone. I've come here to, you know, I, I'm coming here because I need to get, I come to get refreshed. I need to be myself, you know, but, but then we come in here and then we got to play the game with you because you acting like a deep wonder. So I got to act like a deeper wonder than you because it, and we come in here and we're frustrated and miserable. And this is why people don't want to go to church. They really, most of you wouldn't come to church, but you just ain't got no place else to go. So you're stuck here. But you know, if you had an alternative, you'd be there. And the reality is, is that God's house should be a place of reflection a place where we can be ourselves a place that we can come in and tell God because you ain't gonna disturb me you may disturb me but you ain't gonna mess God up if you tell him you know what I'm just sick of folks I'm sick of your people I'm sick of my people I'm sick of all these people come on somebody you know it's true and I'm just sick I'm sick and tired I'm if another person say praise the Lord we are gonna fight in here up in here up in here we're going to be bout it, bout it. You hear what I'm talking about? You better not. So we deal with a generation uh, and we're frustrated because we can't be ourselves. We can't be ourselves. And so we ignore things in our lives. We ignore issues in our lives. We don't really want to deal with the real issues in our life. We come here to be ourselves and we can't, we can't deal with the real issues in our life because we have to play the game. We have to play the game and so we can't we cannot acknowledge that there are some things in me there are some issues that i need to deal with but but i can't i don't want to kill it i think i need it so we keep things we keep our ego our arrogance our pride our self-righteousness the little things well they're not a, i ain't sleeping with nobody you know, and that's what salvation really is an issue of now. It's about keeping your pants up and your dress down. I was talking with a... Uh, uh, I, I won't talk about that, but anyways. <laughs> I'll leave that alone. But sometimes I'm amazed at, at where the church is, where the church is. I mean, you know, I was, we were dealing with a couple of things recently, and I said, we found out how many... They sold five million tapes of No More Sheets. No more sheets. That's the prophet is Juanita buying them. So five million cassettes. No more sheets. And you know what I had? To, I said there was five million folks in the church with some sheets. I, want, I said, is anybody living holy? 
I didn't know that many folks had problems. I said, five million, you preach a message on the anointing, you can't sell 50. But she said, five, but can I get three for my, my sister and my cousin? And that's not, that's not against uh, Prophetess Bynum. God gave her that word for a hurting church. But I was amazed. I said, God, is this how far the church has come? That we cannot even deal with issues like sexual integrity. That there's no sexual integrity in the church to the point that we got to teach folks how to just keep their pants on. What is wrong with the body? And then we wonder why we can't go into the deeper things of God. Because we, and, and yet, yet, and then you have the opposite extreme, which is folks that, that think, well, if I'm not having sex, I'm fine. But there are other issues in our life that we ignore, and as long as we ignore them, those are the things that are destroying us. They are devouring us because we are unwilling to acknowledge them. So when God told Saul, kill everything, he meant kill everything. When God tells you, listen, it's time for you to do warfare in your life. And I love this. You know, Christians just love spiritual warfare. We all just want to fight every demon, every devil. Oh, I'm, we're going to fight the prince demon of Gary, Indiana. And you can't even deal with your own self-righteousness in your life. The issue, real warfare is not here. Real warfare is right here. You want to fight this, deal with this. If you can whoop this, this cannot affect you here unless it affects you here. See, the devil cannot come nigh your dwelling. Once you are in the kingdom of God, he's not allowed to directly touch you. But what he does then is he deals with your mind and he sends thoughts across the airwaves because he is the prince of the power of the air. So just like music and radio waves, he deals with the airwaves and sends thoughts and suggestions. No man can pluck you out of God's hand, but you can walk out, baby. The devil can't pluck you out, but he can tell you, come here. Leave the safety of where you are. Or oh, just one time, just one little lie won't hurt you. Or oh, just this, and then we deal with that, and we don't realize that we are coming with those little small things that we are unwilling to acknowledge, those little small things that we are unwilling to recognize, those little small things become monsters because we didn't deal with them when God told us to deal with them. So when the prophet Samuel comes, he delays. He was supposed to come and offer sacrifice, and Saul says that the prophet has not come so therefore I will offer sacrifice see be very careful most people miss the move of God in timing timing is very critical in understanding what God does it's not doing it when you want it to be done it's operating and stepping forward at God's appointed time for your season the Bible says now I say unto you that an heir as long as he is a child differs nothing from a servant though he be Lord of all but is under tutors and governors until a time appointed of the father see everything we are learning in the church is not for us to operate on Shandai, shoot a mosquito, kickstart a Honda. Oh, mama, my knee hurt. Can I see it in my sunglasses? E D D I E. That spells Eddie. Come on, speak. Don't leave. Y'all prophesy. Don't act Baptist on me. Come on. These speaking tongues. Mama say, mama saw something. Come on. Michael came out with a new album. So we deal with a generation that's unwilling to deal with real issues the prophet comes delayed Saul misses the timing of God most of us miss the timing of God timing is absolutely essential there are many promises that God has given us one of this the, one of the great things of this generation of the church one of the best things and what a joy it is to live in this generation of the church because there's such an abundance of, of good preaching and we hear stuff preached and we immediately believe that's me oh God wants me to be rich God wants me to do this. God wants me to do that. And he does. But when is the issue? And we miss God on the issues of when. See, a child, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant. I've used that. I've talked about that here before. And so that as long as you're a child, you don't have the right to operate or, or apprehend certain blessings. You have to wait till you mature until the time appointed of the Father. If you operate in something outside of the time appointed, then you've got to take care of it. See, if you buy something that you can't afford outside of the timing of God, then don't be mad because he ain't helping you pay for it. 
And so there's a lot of people that are finding themselves stressed over stuff because they're trying to keep up with the Joneses and do stuff and do things. And they're just trying to do, you know, always trying to be ahead. And now they're stuck and ain't got no money to pay it. And now they're frustrated and they're blaming God and mad at the church and mad at people. And the people told me if I gave that offer and I'd be blessed and I gave it and bought a car and I can't afford it. They're about to lose it. And now I'm going to have my credit messed up. All because you miss God and the timing. It's the same thing with a marriage. It's not that, that sometimes two people aren't called to love one another. It's about being being married at the right time being mature enough to enter into a wedding not just talking about the holy ghost show me you the one i'm going to marry you that's not enough to just believe that god showed you who it is there are issues you've got to deal with and discuss and talk about and and re recognize that the person you're marrying is for life and so you've got to understand that there are some differences if you're a firstborn and she's the last born she's spoiled and you ain't You better know that going in because firstborn children are used to picking up stuff. Lastborn children are used to leaving stuff on the floor. You better know that going in. People have gotten divorced over the toilet seat where they've been left up or put down. I'm leaving you. I said put it down. You better find out where he squeezed the toothpaste from the middle or from the end. That could be a, a grounds for divorce in some states. I don't want to turn on television and see you up there at divorce court. I say, oh, Lord, I'm from Gary Christian Center. I told him. <laughs> that wouldn't, that's just not right. But we deal with that. The reality is, is that there are issues. You have to deal with the timing of God. In ministry, it's not that you're not called. It's that knowing when you're supposed to step out on your calling. And if you force it before the... People are always asking me, Bishop, how did you get in these doors open? How, you know, three years ago, nobody knows about you. And now, still, most people don't know about me. It's okay. But some, more people know about me now than they did before. Praise the Lord. And I said, how did, who did, I said, listen, I've never given nobody a tape. I never handed nobody a video. I never, I've never handed nobody a business card. I just did what I did. I do what I do. I preach. I declare God's word. I move in the prophetic. And I do it with the way God's given me to do it. And when, if God wants doors open, people, the way this pastor met me was the prophetess Melissa was here. And she said, you, you didn't need to hear about this man of God. He's a great man of God. And it doesn't matter what powers are against you. It doesn't matter what attack of the enemy comes against you. When is your day? When is your time? Bishop Jakes, I, when I, I was preaching in Potter's House, one of the things that I was, when I was sharing, I said, listen, what Bishop is preaching to 10,000 or 26,000 members in Potter's House on a Sunday morning, what he's preaching to 26,000 people, he was preaching to 300 in Virginia. It wasn't a different message. He was faithful over what God gave him in Virginia. And when he proved he was faithful over that, then God could trust them with 28,000 people in five years in Texas. But he had to wait for the timing. If he moved to Texas 10 years ago, he'd only have 300 people in Dallas. He had to wait for the moment, the timing, when God... God ordained for him to come to the place that God wanted him to be in and he tells a story how that it was only a seven minute shot how that Paul Crouch was walking through an office and somebody it wasn't even on a show somebody was watching it in an office they were just watching this videotape of, of Bishop Jake's preaching behind closed doors and Bishop uh, Paul Crouch just saw seven minutes of the message and those seven minutes so touched him that he said find this man and the rest is history timing you have to be faithful. He missed it in the timing. The prophet comes delayed. Now, here's the next point that's very important concerning the life of Saul. Not only did he miss it in the timing, which is where most of us miss it, is in timing. He also missed it by stepping outside of his anointing. He was a king, not a prophet. And he went to do the work of the prophet when he was supposed to be a king. The Bible says to abide in your own calling. It is very important that we know who we are. And we abide in our own gifting. The one, I'm telling you, one of the worst things in the world is to suffer through somebody's ministry as they're suffering through it. Have you ever heard a bad sermon? Somebody that can't preach. No anointing to preach. Have you ever had to suffer through? Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. It's nothing worse. And, and you just, and see, I tell people, I tell them, I say, baby, look, there's something we got to find. Can you sing? Can you count money? And I will tell them, I said, listen, you're not called up. There's no anointing on you. There's no presence of God. There's nothing. 
And no reason for us to suffer here because you've esteemed to something you're not called to. And see, we, instead of just patting this, why you got all these little storefront churches with three members, four people, and people just sitting there suffering and all this stuff, and, and churches struggling, and no anointing, no ministry, no power of God, no passion for the things of God. And somebody just needs to be truthful and just say, look, man, you just ain't called. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you in a minute, you may be called to the kingdom, but you're not called to say nothing in it. You don't get up trying to prophesy and calling people out and then telling them all stuff ain't got nothing to do with them. Like, what? You know, a prophet may miss it every now and then, but not every time. Everybody in the church walking out confused. I'm like, let's trade tapes because there's this one one for me. Maybe it was for you. I mean, you hear what I'm talking about. He stepped outside of his anointing. That's not only, let me deal with this, that's not only in terms of ministry, that has to do even with your secular careers and stuff. Your destiny is always connected to your desire and to your pleasure. God is not going to call you to do something that you hate. You know, some of you have jobs that you hate and you've been working it for 10 years. You don't like it, you don't enjoy it, you go every day, you're mad going, just like, oh, boy, somebody, I wish somebody would say something to me today. They better not even talk to me today. And you walk in with a look on your face like, you just try it. Because this may not be a post office, but when I get through with it, they may. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And you're miserable. That is not your destiny. Let me say this to you. Contrary to popular Christian teaching, just because you have a destiny, a purpose, and it is something that you love. It may not always produce the lifestyle that you desire. But it's better to be happy and do what you love than to be miserable and do what you hate. Now you listen to me. The greatest artists, some of the greatest artists, were poor their whole life. Broke. But they did what they loved and they were accepted after their death I don't think we have to be broke I praise God I don't think we got to be poor but I do think that many people because they they think in their mind that the only proof that God is with them is there is what they drive and what they live in and they strive for that and they're not really happy and so that's why even spiritually it reflects in your spiritual life it reflects in your marriage this is why your marriage is stressed out because you and him are working two jobs to pay for stuff that you can't afford and you all haven't even had any time to go on a date some of you've been married and it's been two three years since you just had private time between you and and her between any intimate time because you're so busy trying to keep up the facade that you are neglecting what makes a marriage. A marriage doesn't need a house. A marriage can succeed in an efficiency. And she'll come and just buy a little plant and put it in and, and turn the pillow upside down and, and make you feel like, what'd you do? Look like it's a whole new <laughs> living room and bedroom because it's the same room, but we love each other, baby. <laughs> no, seriously, there, there is something to, you know, there is something about that. There is something to say about our parents and our grandparents. And, those, and their parents who, who didn't have a lot of stuff, but they, they had a relationship and they lasted for 40, 50, 60, 75 years. They died. You know, they died, you, you, they died while they were together. We don't hear about that no more. You know what I'm talking about? There, there's something to, to be said, something to be honored in that, about understanding the timings and seasons and abiding in your own anointing, abiding in your own call. Staying where you're called to do, what you're called to do and where you're called to be. It, we have to understand the difference between a set man or a first man and a second man. Some people are called to be preachers and leaders in the church, but they do not have a first man anointing. They do not have the set man's anointing. They are not called to pastor a church. They are called to be an associate. And you have to understand that that's not a bad thing. And you have to be free from your ego and other people to feed your ego just because you're called to preach means that you're supposed to be a first man. A first man has a certain anointing. There's a certain charism that they carry about them that prepares them for that anointing. And everybody doesn't have it. And they have to be comfortable just being the second man. And it's not demeaning. Second is not less than. It's just different than. You understand that there's no such thing as a lesser anointing or a greater anointing. There are just different anointings. Every, the Spirit gives different gifts, not lesser gifts. Oh, y'all are quiet. I'm trying to get to David. 
They got a big old clock up there. Okay, let me. I just saw it. That's my time almost up. So now watch. Saul offers sacrifice, steps outside of his anointing, and immediately God says, because you've stepped outside of your anointing, you've lost the kingdom. Now God rejects him. Why? Because, he, because obviously, see, why did God reject him? Doesn't that seem like an extreme thing? All he did was offer sacrifice to God. See, we can do things sincere, but if we do them outside of the season, outside of God's purpose, outside of what God anoints us for, then what you are telling God, what Saul was telling God is, you didn't know what you were doing. Do you understand? That's what Saul, it's a slap in the face of God. In other words, God, you should have made me a prophet. You made me a king. You didn't know what you were doing. This is why when we step outside of our anointing, we are slapping God in the face because we are telling him, you don't know what you're doing. We are telling him that his decisions are not right for our life. So we make our own. See, you don't understand the little things that you're doing in your life. They are putting you in such spiritual peril. Your life is, is, is going through immense trauma. Because you have stepped outside and you thought, well, it was only this. But you don't realize what your only is to God. To you it's only. But to him it's, I've invested my Everything I have, my whole kingdom in this one moment for your life. And you stepped outside of it. You understand that? If everybody in the church was called to preach, who would be pastor? Who would work secular jobs? How could we build the kingdom of God if nobody's working? How could you have normal lives? How can you impact people who would come to church if everyone's in the church? God puts you on your jobs to be light. He gives you, and he sanctifies that moment. And, and work is sacred wherever it is. It is what you are doing in your secular job is as important as what I'm doing here. It is not lesser than, it is different than. And it is necessary, it is important, it is vital. See, we, we, we distinguish even, it, see, you try to talk about a garbage man. I, I would never be a garbage man. You let all the garbage men quit today. Let them all quit today and find out how much you like living in Gary, Indiana. They are very vital and important, and we need to cease to demean work. Work is good, and we have to demean it. It is sacred, and we offer it. Whatever you do in word or in deed, do it as unto the Lord Jesus Christ. So Saul stepped outside of his anointing and missed God. We are dealing with a generation of people that are stepping outside of their anointing. Now, in the midst of him stepping outside, God speaks to Samuel and tells Samuel, I need you to do something. Samuel says, what do you want me to do, Lord? He says, I need you to go down to Jesse's house. Why? I need you to anoint a new king over Israel. Samuel says, yes, Lord. Can you imagine him going now? Here goes Samuel down to the Jesse's house. Jesse is an Ephratite living in the city of Bethlehem. Judah, the house of bread, the city of praise. Bethlehem means the house of bread. Lechem means life. Lechem means bread. Life and bread, the house of life and the house of bread. It had to be that because Jesus would be born through the city of David, would be born through the line of David, and Jesus would be called the bread that's come down from heaven. So he had to be born in Bethlehem. Are you with me? So here comes Samuel, and Samuel goes down to Jesse's house, and the Bible says immediately, like most of us do, he calls for the eldest son there. Jesse brings out the eldest son and he goes to anoint him and God says he's not the one. Even though he looked like a king, he had the appearance of a king, he had all of the outward attributes. And God said he's not the one. See, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. True qualities for leadership are, are always begin with the internal interior life. One of the things that we lack in the charismatic church is an in interior life. We have a very external life. We are loud and we talk and we praise and we shout and we dance and, we're, and you see us and we move and we wave our hands and clap our hands. But very few of us have understand the sacredness of silence. The interior life, the praying within yourself, praying and, and, and tapping into God when no one can see you, when you're just doing your normal things, but, you're, but your inside, your inner man is being strengthened. So he looks at the oldest made one. He says, this is not him. He goes through each son. Each one comes out and he thinks, this, well, this has got to be the one. No, he ain't the one either. He goes through all seven sons. 
Seven is God's perfect number. And none of them. And the Bible says that he has to ask, do you have any other sons? Because Jesse, by this time, you know, I done showed you everything that can be a king. You know, is there any, got to be one left. God told me he's in your house. Well, I got another son, but you don't want to meet him. He just, I, I put him out with the sheep. Just wait, he can't harden, harm, harm nobody. Just let him be out there. He's a little off. He's just not fully together. He's always singing and talking to himself and writing poetry. Just like, a little, you know, he's not, I'm trying to make him be a man. He's over there playing a little harp. Look at this. Come here, come here, Samuel. Look, right here. Read this stuff. Read this. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the seat or the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate both day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Samuel said, anybody that can write like this, go get him brought David over and the Bible says that he took a horn filled with oil and anointed poured the horn of oil out on David saturated a horn there's a very powerful symbol of that because before David could be anointed an animal had to die by the killing of an animal the horn is cut off and when the animal dies the horn is cut off and filled see there can be no release of anointing until there is first a death to something that is precious there will be no release of anointing in your life until there's a part of you that dies See, it's a type, that was a type of Jesus who before what was in him could get in us what he had to die. So now is the hour when the Son of Man should be glorified. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. And they knew not that he spoke of the crucifixion. Are you with me? So he was saying when they kill me, then what's in me will come out of me so I can be glorified. I can't be glorified till I get in you, but I can't get in you as long as I'm alive. So when they kill me, they think they're getting rid of one son. They kill one son, and many sons are born into the kingdom. There's a release of the anointing. Are you seeing that? So before David could be anointed, it's the same thing with Elijah and Elisha. Before Elisha could inherit Elijah's anointing, the Bible said he had to cross over the river Jordan. Jordan is a type of death. Before he could get what Elijah had to give him, he had to go through a spiritual death. This is the reason why when Elisha was going to pass on his anointing to Gehazi, Gehazi who was his servant, he should have got a double portion of the double portion. That meant he should have got a quadruple portion of what Elijah had. That's a mighty anointing. That's four times the anointing that Elijah had but Gehazi was unwilling to die to himself so when Elisha died he took the double portion of the double portion with him and remember only people that can die can get the anointing so when the armies of Israel are fighting in the battlefield and a soldier is killed in the battle and his dead body falls on the bones of Elisha the bones are saying I was waiting for a dead person to pass my anointing on to are you with me See, there's an impartation of the anointing that's reserved for those who are willing to die to their own self. So David now comes and in the process or in the midst of everything that's taking place here, the Bible says that he anoints David. And in the midst of all of this, the Bible says that now there's the Philistine armies are coming out to fight against the, the armies of Israel. And when they come out to fight against the armies of Israel, Saul and all of his armies are in hiding. Why? Because a giant by the name of Goliath who has come from the city of Gath is standing in the midst of the valley saying bring it on one of me against one of you you get the best that you have and let him come fight me now understand this Saul was no midget the Bible says that Saul was the tallest man in the whole kingdom Saul had to be at least seven two seven three he was a giant himself. But see, once you step outside of your anointing, you don't even know who you are anymore. We deal with a generation of people who cannot give you anything because they don't know who they are. See, it is impossible to love someone else till you first love yourself. Love thy neighbor as thyself. So you got to first love yourself before you can love your neighbor. 
That means you've got to be comfortable with who God made you, who you are, happy with you. You have no complaints. You are just happy. This is who God made me. This is what I am. And I am comfortable with what God made me. Are you with me? And so here's, Gal here's Saul and the armies of Israel hiding. And Saul's mocking the children of Israel, telling them, come on, just bring somebody. He tells them, look, you brought the whole army. You don't have to bring the whole army. One on one. That's all I want. And in the midst of this litany, in the midst of this discussion, this conversation, in the midst of this dialogue between Goliath and the children of Israel, the Bible says, now David. I like that. I like the way that it interrupts. Because God does stuff like that. God, in the midst of the attack of the enemy, interrupts him with an unprecedented presence. Some of you are destined to be an unprecedented presence. I'm here to prophesy to some of you that, 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 that this generation of the earth has never seen anybody like the people that are going to come forth in this hour. There's a move of God coming, the lack of which has never been seen in the earth. The glory of the latter house is going to be greater than that of the former house. Hear me. There's coming a generation of anointed people that when they come on the scene, it's going to so blow people's mind because it is unprecedented. One moment they're going to be talking about September 11th and next minute now. We are about to interrupt the devil's plans. How many of you are about to interrupt his plans? Unprecedented stuff. God is about, the devil been messing with you and you've been going through some trials and God is about to send an unprecedented anointing in your life. He's about to shock you into reality with a fresh anointing. David is the eighth son. Seven is the number of perfection but eight is the number of new beginnings Saul was an, a type of the old move of God David was a type of the new move of God are you listening to me God was saying I'm going to this David's a new beginning he's not going to be a king like Saul you know what the Bible says about Saul the Bible says in all the days that when Saul was king they did not inquire of the Lord do you know why Saul missed it because in all of the days that he was running the kingdom he never asked God what do you want? He made all of the decisions for himself and never asked God, what is your will for my life? We deal with a generation that just does whatever they want, but they have never inquired, who do you want for me? See, it's not who you want to marry. It's who he wants you to marry. It's not what you want to do. It's what he wants you to do. God never told us he would give us what we want. He told us he would give us what to want. He will give us the desires of our heart. Not what we want, but what to want. And where you used to want stuff, now you want Him. Oh, I wish you could get this tonight, Gary. I'm almost finished with my introduction. <laughs> so here comes David, and the Bible says that Goliath is cursing all of Israel. Saul, who is a veritable giant himself, is scared and hiding. David comes on the scene because Jesse says, go bring your brother's lunch. He brings his brother's lunch. He has food for him, brings it to him. And when he gets there, his brethren are scared and hiding too. And David says one of the most powerful things that I've ever heard in the scripture. David says, is there not a cause? Comes on the scene and says, is there not a cause? interrupts the process and Samuel and Saul says uh, and he hears what the deal is if you go defeat if somebody defeats them then we'll win David says well I'll do it I'll go fight him now see let me explain to you what David looks like because earlier after David was anointed and Saul got possessed after Saul lost his anointing the Bible says an evil, an evil spirit came on Saul see after you lose you you know when you find evil hateful people in the church it's oftentimes because they've lost their anointing. You ever found miserable people? Have you ever noticed how sometimes even like older people in the church get just hateful like that old usher? Ain't never did. <laughs> Every church got one. You, you know what? Don't look. I ain't talking about you tonight. I, I, just, I ain't talking about you. You all right, man of God. I know he laughing. There. Don't talk about me. Look. But you ever met that, that because they, they saw the move of God and they missed it. There's a generation of church folk, of churches that are so connected to what God did 
that they can't see what God's going to do. And they, now they're just miserable, just attacking everybody. You ain't saving enough. Your dress too short. Your face too makeup. You don't wear too much more jewelry. You don't take off. And really they're miserable because they miss, they lost the anointing. When you lose the anointing, you become possessed and oppressed by demonic spirits. And an evil spirit came on Saul because he lost his anointing and he became miserable. And the only thing that could calm him was music. This is why music is so prevalent in the world. Why it is such a major issue because people are so possessed with demons that the only thing that really calms them or creates is, is music. This is why they, they, it's a multi-billion dollar industry because it's the only thing that can calm the disturbed soul. And this is why you're dealing with gangster rap and so much other stuff because these guys with this violence are turning to music to channel their energy. Because if not, they'd be out killing people. Some still are, but they're better since they've been singing. So I tell them, sing on. <laughs> Just bling bling, long as you ain't bam bam at me, praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Because a man's got to do what a man's got to do. <laughs> So Saul becomes possessed with the evil spirit. David comes on the scene and the Bible says that when his father sends him there, this is, I want you to see what David is. He is cunning in playing. He is valiant. He is a man of war. He is prudent in matters. A comely person. And the Bible says he's even ruddy looking. Which meant he had pink. You know when a little kid, his cheeks are still pink. or You know, he's just weak. He's just not, not weak, but in the sense that he's not... He's not fully developed. He's young. He, you know, he, he hasn't had to shave yet. So this is what David is. He's a kid, comes on the scene and says, well, I'll go fight Goliath. And Saul says, amen. Not, and le, not because Saul actually thought he could win. Not, Saul didn't even want to honor him. Saul thought, okay, that buys me a day. I know he's going to die, but at least that's one day that I'm not dying. So he was willing to send this young man into war just to buy his time. David says, is there not a cause? The whole issue for David was not, not how big Goliath was. The issue for David was, is there not a cause? See, for us, we measure what we're dealing with by how big it is and our capability to deal with it. Instead of asking the question, is God behind me? See, it doesn't matter how big the situation is. If God is behind you, if there's a cause, it, does, it doesn't matter what people say and what people do and how people want to destroy and people want to fight. When there's a cause, when there's an anointing, when there's the purpose of God in your life, that, that nothing else matters. I always deal with stuff. It's always, if it's not one thing, it's another with, with, with me. I can't even win for losing sometimes. I tell people, say, man, can I buy a break, rent a break, lease a break? Can I borrow your break? <laughs> and it's, it's like one thing after another. But, but one of the things that, 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 that I've learned, though, is when God is with you, when it's your season and it's your time, people can lie, they can talk, they can fight, they can disrupt, but it cannot stop the presence of God. It cannot stop God's plan for your life. When it's your hour, baby, nothing's going to hinder it. And really what you have to, que the question that you should be asking is not, oh my God, is this going to hurt me or what is this going to do? The question you need to ask is, God, are you with me? Because if you're with me, this isn't an issue. If you're with me, what they say can't do. If you're with me, what the bank says isn't a problem. If you're with me, what the doctor says isn't a problem. When I was a kid, I was diagnosed with sugar diabetes and, and, and several different things that went on. And, and, and in the midst of a series of events that where the doctor said, if you do not drive dramatically change some of these things and this this will happen and that'll happen and whatever 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 and I said well praise God and then I began to think over my life I said wait excuse me the question is not whether I have diabetes and whether and at that time I was in a car wreck I received the last of my foot I had gotten gangrene in my right foot and 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 uh, they wanted to remove uh, some of the toes and everything and I just and and I just said that's just not cute I need all my toes I don't know for what, but I want them. They're mine. I don't want. 
You know, and, 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 and the question for me was not that. The question for me was, God, am, am I your man? Am I your anointed servant? Have you called me? Is there, is there a prophetic dimension on my life? Is this what you want me to do? And if you want me to do it, then, the, then, the, then nothing else is important. The only thing that's important is, is there a cause? How, and God healed me from the gangrene. We're talking about in a matter of moments, the doctors blew, blew their mind. The sugar diabetes disappeared as if it had never been there. And, and, and just because, not because I was better, but because there was a cause. I was flying to Biloxi, Mississippi one time, with a, and we were flying one of them little them crop duster planes. Because I don't believe planes should have propellers on them anymore. We grew up. <laughs> we've matured. We've learned how, that, you know, that's like a, a horse and buggy. Get rid of the propellers. They got jet engines. If it's not a jet, I ain't getting on it. But one time I had to go. I was going to Biloxi, and they, you know, and the thing's going around, and, and American Eagle, and we flew right, and they couldn't get away. They didn't have enough gas to go back in it. And a, 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 a thunderstorm had come in off the coast, uh, and, it, and they said, we're, we're too far to go back, and so we're going to have to fly right through it and land. And this plane started, I mean, ducking and diving and swishing back and forth. I mean, the winds were just, and the poor old lady next to me, I thought she was going to die in the plane. And she grabbed me, and she just, oh, God, I'm never going to see my grandbabies again. Oh, and she just... And I just, and, and this holy boldness came on me, because really, I mean, everybody, the, you know you're in trouble when the, when the stewardess looks nervous. <laughs> I always watch the stewardess. I watch, I say, uh-huh. I keep an eye on them. And when they sit down and buckle up, I say, oh, no. It's on now. And I just, and, and this woman started holding my arm, and she was just, we're going to die, we're going to die. And I told her, and I just, with just such calmness, I looked at her and said, ma'am, Please let go of my arm. We are not going to die. And she says, she says, how do you know? I said, because I'm on this plane. And if we do crash, I'm the only one getting off, so stay close to me, baby. I got too much destiny, too much purpose, too much cause, too many prophecies haven't been fulfilled, too many things God has not brought to pass yet. The devil can't kill me. You know, sometimes it blows my mind. Sometimes people prophesy over me such big things. And I'd say, you know what? If I live three lifetimes, I couldn't fulfill all of that. You know, were they just excited? You know, have you ever got like prophecies and it was so much bigger than you that you were just like, huh? Who? <laughs> He ain't talking to me. And I realized, that God, why do you do that? He says, because I put such impossible things over people's heads to remind the devil that you cannot kill them. It's a sign of their greatness. It's a sign. They ain't going nowhere. It's there to maintain you. God's promises will maintain you, not just by you confessing them, but by him confessing them over you. See, we think if we confess the word over and over and over, that's going to complete. I got something that can be confessing the word. That's God confessing the word over me. And I believe in confessing the word, but more ex I'm more excited when God says something about me that I can't say about myself. Are you with me? David, God consecrated David to be king. That's why Saul couldn't kill him every time he killed him, because every time he tried to kill him, because David was anointed. And David wasn't going to die until he became king. So he couldn't kill him because he was anointed. Touch your neighbor and say, they can't kill me because I'm anointed. You understand that there's all the things in your life that the devil has designed to destroy you, can't touch you, simply because you are anointed? The anointing isn't there to make you just... That's not what the anointing is there. The anointing is there to maintain you. So now David comes out, is there not a cause? And the first thing Saul does... See, Saul ain't an idiot. He tells David, put on my armor. First of all, David can't fit his armor. So first of all, David looks at him like he's crazy. And see, you're thinking Saul's really concerned for David. Let me give you my armor. No, no, Saul is still trying to buy time. Maybe if Goliath kills you wearing my armor, he'll think you were Saul. Because the tradition was when the Philistines ever ca captured a country, the first thing they did was slaughter the king and his kids. So Saul's trying to think, this give me a few days to get out of town. He didn't care about David. He cared about himself. But David knew who he was. 
See, most of us deal with an identity crisis. And David said, listen, it's not an issue about me putting on your armor. I'm not a soldier. I'm not a king. You understand that? So he, David said, I'm a, I'm a shepherd. This is how I fight. I fight with a stick and with rocks. Watch this, folks. Watch this. Are you, you, you hearing me? So how does he overcome the enemy? He says, he, first of all, he's comfortable with who he is. He says, I don't need to put on your armor because I know who I am. See, most of us are trying to put on another man's armor, another man's anointing, another man's ministry, another man's message, another man's style, another man. You got to be yourself. You got to know who you are. And you don't have to put on another man's armor. You need to be comfortable and confident in who God made you. David said, I'm not a king and I'm not a soldier. I'm a shepherd. And I kill a lion and I kill a bear with a rock and with, some, with a stick. And if I'm going to kill this giant, I'm going to kill him the same way I kill those. I shouldn't have been able to kill them, but God was with me there. So God has to be with me here. And David understood that the spiritual warfare that was about to take place, it was far more spiritual than natural because Goliath was a part of a particular clan and these, these giants were not only soldiers, but they were called warrior priests. The Philistines had a group that were called warrior priests so that there was a priesthood that worshipped the god Dagon. And when they worshipped the god Dagon, they were priests of the god Dagon. That's why when you see Goliath fighting with David and fighting with the children of Israel, he's using actually mind warfare because he's speaking and as much as he's speaking they're afraid why were they afraid because everything that came out of his mouth was filled with witchcraft it was filled with an evil spirit so it kept them in fear so Saul said bring it on come on he says my God shall defeat your gods he says and he's as he's speaking this the spirit of fear is over him that's why you got to be very careful who you let speak over you you got to be careful what television programs what movies you watch what music you listen to what sermons you listen to what messages everybody out there preaching ain't preaching truth and everybody ain't declaring the things of God a lot of people are speaking things that put stuff in our spirit that's not from God so Goliath is fighting the spiritual war David comes on the scene and when David gets there the Bible says that now he's filled with the glory of God he doesn't wear any armor that Saul gives him because he doesn't prove it he says, I've not proved it. David goes to fight him. And the Bible says on his way to go fight him, he takes five stones. Five smooth stones from a brook. A brook is living water. Five is the number of fivefold ministry. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Watch it. He takes five not rough stones. See, some ministries, even though they may be part of the fivefold ministry, they're still rough. And if they're not washed with the water, the water is a type of the word. We are washed with the water of the word. This is why the, the word smooths out the rough edges of ministry to make them fly straight. The reason they, they had to be smooth is so when they were released, they could hit their target and they could fly straight. And so we deal with a lot. We have a lot of rough edge ministries that have not been polished and smoothed by the water of God's word. And that's why you have to be in a local church where you're being taught, and that's why every preacher needs someone to preach to him. Because it constantly helps perfect them. That's why every preacher needs a home church. And pastors have conferences where they bring in other people to help benefit them and bless them. This is why this man of God has this conference. Not only bless you, but so that he's receiving the word of the Lord over his life and over her life. So as they're hearing it, they're being polished and perfected into the glory of God. And just like when I leave here, I got to go sit up under men too so they could feed my spirit and, and, and get the little rough edges off me because I still have some rough edges. You see me, let someone drive slow in the left lane. You'll see some rough I said, boy, you just hold on, just wait. Let me take this off so you don't know who I am. And I'm going to put, boy, pull on, baby. <laughs> we have rough edges that God's trying to deal with us on and a lot of different things. And we have to be very wise as to what God is doing. And, and, and we have to allow the water of God's word to smooth us and to perfect our ministries and the gift of God that is on our life. What else happened to David? The Bible says now, after this whole process, he goes to fight G Goliath, and he tells Goliath, Goliath says that I'm going to defeat you, destroy you, give your head, I'm going to behead you, I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds of the air, and he goes on to prophesy all this stuff, and David says, are you finished? You come to me with a sword, spear, and shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. 
David says, this day the Lord shall deliver your head into my hand. This day God's going to deliver your head. And the Bible says that he releases, he releases the stone and that, that stone flies straight, hits Goliath right in the forehead. Why the forehead? Spiritual warfare. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God for the tearing down of strongholds. Next verse, casting down imaginations. See, David understood that Goliath, your sword is not what's killing Israel. Your spear and shield is not. This battle ain't got nothing to do with weapons. This battle has got to do with what's coming out of your mouth. And so I've got to stop your mouth. And this is why when he released the stone and the stone hit him in the head and it killed him and laid him back. Now, Goliath was dead. But why didn't David just leave Goliath there? They, the Bible says David went and got Goliath's sword. Now, first of all, that meant he had supernatural strength because you can't pick up a giant sword and you a kid. But he picked up Goliath's sword and beheaded Goliath. Why did he have to behead Goliath? Because the beheading is a type of that this is the end of your day. Your hour is over. Your authority, because the headship is a type of authority. Every prophecy, every lie, every lying demon, every lying spirit that you release, every witchcraft that you release against the body, against the children of Israel, is now broken and released. So when I lift up the head, they'll know that that power is for once and for all broken. This is why it is so very important. You got to understand this. The Bible says that the heel of the, of the child will bruise the head of the serpent. Why does it bruise the head, not the body? Because the only authority that the serpent has, which is the devil, comes from his mouth. Comes from what he says to us. So the only power that the devil really has is what he's saying to us. So when Jesus destroys the devil, he bruises his head. This is why when Jesus came on the scene and was baptized by John, and John had to die because John was the last type of the Old Testament prophet. He was the last prophet of the Old Testament. When John was martyred, the Bible says that he was beheaded. Why was he beheaded? Because the true head came on the scene. And John was a type of the Old Testament. But now the Old Testament had no headship because Jesus was the head. Head. So John had to lose his head so Jesus could become the head. Are you getting this? So he beheads Goliath, and when he beheads Goliath, the power of Goliath is broken. The children of Israel are released into the next level. And the Bible says that immediately as the people begin to sing praises, they begin to say, Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands of ten thousands. Now David didn't kill but one person. He didn't kill. He didn't fight in the war. He killed one and sat back. And the people gave him more praise than Saul, and Saul became jealous. Guard your heart against jealousy. I know many ministries that get jealous, and it's surprising because I know men, like I I'll always talk to guys and I say, you know, man, uh, I've been around this many years. I've done this, this, and this. And I don't understand why they're so successful. I don't understand why everybody's inviting them to preach. I don't understand how they could, you know, how this, this, and that, and that, that, and this. And they, and they get jealous because they feel they should be farther than where they are. And other men come on the scene and explode. And God gives them all this favor. And they're saying, how did they get bigger than me? How do they have more members than me? How did they get more, more successful than me? And jealousy comes in. And jealousy begins to destroy and begins to devour. And this is what was dealing with Saul. Saul became jealous because David, in killing one, did slay 10,000 of 10,000 because the real warfare was not with the people it was something far more greater than that and by killing one see David was a wise warrior see sometimes you can destroy more things by dealing with the most important issue than dealing with all the other things see sometimes the devil what he does in your life is he distracts you with all the little fires burning in your life that you're not dealing with the real issue in your life and so you ignore it because all oh, this is going wrong that's going wrong and as long as you ignore it you're ignoring but if you could defeat that one big thing in your life then all of the other stuff automatically come in line under if you could destroy the headship over your life then you enter into submission to the things of God then everything else falls in line it's the same thing with prayer as long as you're praying for a bunch of the little stuff you're praying for you believe in for all this little stuff you ain't never gonna get nothing David said one thing have I desired of the Lord and that will I seek after you know what the problem is with you your prayer list is too long if you got anything more than one thing you pray in too many things 
you've got to find the one thing that consumes your life. And in that one thing, if that one thing is taken care of, everything else is automatically given to you. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness, and all of these other things shall be added to you. Everything, all of you, the problem is you pray in all of the other things except the one thing. If you pray the one thing, you get the other thing. But if you pray the other things, you don't get the one thing. You understanding it? That's the key. People, you know, my whole life, in, in, when I was, we, I pray for the things of God. My whole heart is for a passion for Jesus Christ. I tell the Lord, I just want to be like you. That's my prayer every day. Is, Lord, I want to be like you. I long for you. You alone are my heart's desire. You are all that I desire. You are all that I want. And I pray that every day, every day, every day. I haven't had to, I don't have to pray for nothing else. I pray for that. And as, the, as much as I grasp, grab a hold of God, I long for him. I said, I long for your presence, I long for your presence. Well, you can't get in God's presence and not be anointed. You can't get in God's presence and not understand his word. So I don't pray for messages. I pray for God's presence. And when God shows up, he wrote the book so he can explain it. Now, now I don't have to pray for stuff because now I'm preaching the word. People hear the word. They hear my tapes. They listen. They're blessed. They invite me to speak. I go out. They give me my honorarium check. I get paid good for what I do because I'm, not, I'm an intelligent man. I'm not up here just trying to shuck and juck. I'm giving you truth, the things of God. I'm worthy of my heart. I get, I get what I go. I go out and buy what I want. I don't have to pray for it. I, I don't have to go to a, a car lot and get oil and anoint a car and walk around it seven times and pray over it. I can walk up to it, sign a check, and say, I want that one right there. Can you put some 20s on it make sure it's polished up right put me a couple of tv sets in the back and just be blessed in the presence of god i don't have to pray for it i call this year we just seen blessing after blessing one of my friends i was I'm, I'm just by doing nothing somebody called me they said listen i'm the the, the, the vice president of, uh, of of our hospital we have a hospital here in los angeles and we want you to be the president of the hospital that's simply an honorary position uh to be on the board of trustees i said what i gotta do you ain't gotta do nothing i said that's my kind of job <laughs> they said you ain't you don't have to do nothing uh you, you just come to the annual board meeting that so we will benefit two different ways we have the honor of saying that we have the youngest archbishop in the orthodox church in 700 years as a president of our hospital that's good for us it looks good in our board of trustees it impress a lot of people and the second thing is is that we have a fleet of mercedes that we own and we're not going to pay you a salary but we're going to go ahead and give you the top of the line mercedes fully loaded i said well how much is it going to cost me they said nothing i said what about insurance they said we're going to pay for it i said that sounds like god to me I didn't have to pray for a Mercedes. What was I doing? I was seeking the things of God. And all of these other things are added to me. All of these other things are just added. Added. You see what I'm talking about? When it's time for me, we were get, buying a, a diocese house for the diocese, you know, an Episcopal mansion. We wanted to do all the things that were right to be left there. And I was looking and, and, and they said, well, Bishop, we, we found a beautiful piece of property. We want you to come lay hands on it. I said, lay hands on it. I ain't lay, what, lay hands on it. Does it have everything? Does it have hardwood floors, marble, brushed brass? This is stuff that I like. You know, they said it has all that stuff. I said, I ain't got to lay hands on it. I said, write them a check. <laughs> well, pray for what? What are we praying for? We be, I've been seeking the face of God. Now, these things are just coming. I don't have to claim these things. I'm not going to worry about it. Why waste my prayer time on that? When that, that's an extra 15 minutes, I could be loving him. I could be praying for souls in the kingdom. Why? And you know, we're so consumed with stuff, we don't even pray spiritual things anymore. If you listen to your prayer list every night, you don't pray about nothing that, that, that really impresses God. We are so self-centered. It's like, God, you know I'm suffering. God, you know I can't. I'm so tired of being lonely. God, please give me a husband and just a job and some money and a car and I can't catch the bus no more and I need a house. I'm tired of renting. And I'm tired, God, I need some clothes. And they're having a sale. And God, if you just bless me and probably help me pay these credit cards off. And that's our whole prayer. And no, you know, some of us pray like that. It's true. And just God, and it's only God save my son because he ain't no good. And then you got to deliver him. And all, only about our stuff. You don't have a heart for the things of God. You're not praying. You're not praying for third world countries. What's going on in Afghanistan and other. God turned the hearts of the Muslims. Save the Muslim world. Let them see the glory of Jesus Christ so they can get rid of this anger. So we can stop being worried about flying. Because I ain't been right since. <laughs> I usually didn't believe in your private jet. I said, that's a waste of money. You know, flying your own private jet. I said, no, that's a sign of wisdom now. I'm... <laughs> well, I may be claiming one thing. I did... He ain't added it yet, so I'm... I may need a name and claim that one. I'm not sure. 
But I get on now, man. You better not even look funny. I watch you. I sit right in first class. And see, now I tell churches, I said, the reason I got to fly first class is not only because of luxury, but I'm, I got to defend the, the, I got to defend the plane. They let you on first. And I'll, I'll look at even, I'll let them. Oh yeah, they come on looking for I say, you know, don't even try. You better not even go to the bathroom on this flight. Oh no. I'll take this cross and turn it to a weapon. You don't even know. Uh, uh. Saul becomes intensely jealous with David. Intensely jealous. Here's David on the scene, man. David moving in the power of God. Intensely jealous of what happens. Saul agrees to let David marry his firstborn daughter. He marries Michael, Michael. Marries Michael as his wife. David goes through a series of events where he has to flee the presence of Saul. Because the Bible says every time that Saul sees him, he wants to kill him. Do you know some of you, every time you come in, this generation, let me tell you about this, this generation of the church. There is coming such an anointing on our life. And there's the old move of God and the present move of God. And some of those people in the old move of God, they prayed for revival. They hunger for revival. But when it comes, because it's not coming the way they thought it would come, they're going to despise it. And every time they see us moving in the anointing, there's almost going to be like a jealousy. It's going to be, they're not even going to know why they're regretting it. Why they're infuriated. Can I tell you, as we begin to move in the deeper things of God, people are going to become infuriated with what God is doing in our life because they're not going to be able to comprehend the things that God is doing in our life because they didn't think it would happen this way. And every time Saul saw David, every time Saul saw David, it reminded him of what he lost. He didn't even know that David was anointed to be king, but the spirit in him knew, you got what I once had. Amen. Oh, it's a hard thing when you know you lost your dedication, lost your prayer life, lost the thing, the consecration used to be on your life, and somebody comes in the church full of zeal and full of fire and full of the things of God, and you just look at them and say, and then you, and then you wonder, they just get them under, I wish they shut up, always jumping up and praising God and making all that noise. You just upset because you just dried up, boring, you ain't been able to praise God in five years. You ain't got nothing to be excited about. Now you mad at them because they're full of zeal. And if I, it don't take all that. No, it used to take all that. But now it don't take all that for you because you done got so, so sophisticated. And so no, what's happened is you lost the anointing and you despise God's presence. Yes. Kept trying to kill him. And the Bible says that God raises up a young man by the name of Jonathan. Jonathan is David's, is Saul's son. And the Bible says that Jonathan prophesied to David and said, Thou shalt be king of Israel. Surely thou art a prince. And the Bible says that David and Jonathan exchanged clothes. And the clothes that Jonathan was wearing, David now wore. And the clothes that David wore, Jonathan now wore. Why? That's a very powerful symbol. Because first of all, the exchange of clothes makes a reference to an exchange of anointing. There was a change of anointing. You can get anointing three ways. By the laying on of hands, by listening to people, or by the exchange of a garment. Elijah and Elisha. The priest had certain garments. The woman touched the hem of his garment. David and Goliath, or David and Jonathan exchanged clothes. Why? The clothes that Jonathan was wearing were the clothes of a prince. The clothes that Jonathan was wearing was what the prince wears. David was not a prince, but when Jonathan gave him his clothes, he put on the prince clothes because he was walking in a princely anointing. This is why when the Bible says a woman put not on that which pertaineth to a man, neither let a man put on that which pertaineth to a woman, it's not talking about dress and pants. It's not talking about women shouldn't wear pants. And men, I mean, men wear robes when they preach and women wear pants today. We know it's not talking about that. What it's saying is do not put on that which belongs to a woman. In other words, don't let a woman put on pants that a man wore before because whatever you wear gets your spirit so when a woman puts on pants that a man wore before she begin to walk like a man and if a man put on a dress that a woman wore he begins to walk like a woman because that is designed to that person only it's got their spirit on it are you listening to me he's not talking about a dress code pants ain't never kept nobody out of God's kingdom but but there's a spirit that's why even the music we listen to people we hang out with transference of spirits we have to be very careful that there's not a transfer of spirit so now he exchanged clothes and here's the pitiful thing about jonathan because jonathan prophesies the move of god prays for the move of god declares the move of god tells david you are the next king he prophesies that david he fights for david he saves david's life he he warns david that saul is coming to destroy him and in the midst of all of this jonathan still feels 
connected to Saul. And because he cannot distinguish Saul from David, because he cannot leave, because he is emotionally attached to what God did. He get, see, sometimes he got so comfortable living in the palace. See, sometimes when you get comfortable living in the palace, you are unwilling to suffer for the anointing. And sometimes to get the anointing, you got to suffer. Sometimes you got to be uncomfortable for a season. There's not a single man of God that has any success today that you do not talk to and hear the stories of what they had to go through. You hear the story before Kenneth Copeland became a multi-billionaire and, and is worth billions because he has oil on his property. Worth billions, not millions, billions of untouched resources and and but before he got that him and his wife lived for a whole month off a bag of potatoes and the word and we all want to people want to get mad at him for what he has but they weren't they, they weren't like nobody brought him a steak or chicken no you know it's true when you were catching the bus it's like it's not like anybody actually pulled over and told you hey baby do you need a ride they just blew their horn but be praise the lord I you See you at church next Sunday. Don't get mad. So when God blesses you, you don't, have to, you don't have to feel guilty for being blessed because you knew that you had been faithful over the few things that God had for you. So when God pours stuff in your life, don't get mad. Never, you know, and when people get jealous at you, they say, hey, you should have gave me a ride when you had a chance. I'd give you a ride now, but be beat back to you. <laughs> no, I'm only playing. You give them a ride. Don't you be mean like, shame on you. You know better, Gary. Don't return evil for evil. Give him a ride, but make sure you get some gas money. Give me some. <laughs> David comes into the presence of God. David is faithful over what God gives him. And I, 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 there's so much I want, I, I would tell you about what, what's going on here. Because there are so many different things, uh, so many prophetic things, how David gets Goliath's sword. When David goes down into the tabernacle, and the Bible says that when the, the, he has no sword. And the Bible says he goes into the temple. And God doesn't kill him. He goes and feeds his men with the shoe bread, which belongs only to the priest, which was an unprecedented. Can I tell you that we are about to go into some unlawful areas? Paul said that I heard some things that were unlawful for me to repeat. This generation is about to break the rules. I'm about to tell you there's coming a move of God in this generation, the like of which has never been seen, and it is unprecedented. And when it happens, people are not going to be able to define it because it's going to break the rules. It's not going to happen the way we think it should happen. It's not going to happen because people are going to just say, we don't believe it. And so D David, the Bible says that David went and fed his men with the shoe bread. And then the Bible says when he heard that Saul's army was coming, he went and looked and had no weapon. And the priest told him how that in the closet, Saul's or, 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 or Goliath's sword. Can you imagine what were they doing with Goliath's sword? They took it off there and put it. And the Bible says they put it in with the dirty linen ephods. A linen ephod was the garments that a priest wore when he went to go minister into the Holy of Holies. And what was discarded. See, some people have discarded their anointing they have discarded the purpose they have discarded their ministry they have discarded the things that god has given them but hidden in that hidden where nobody else sees it is a sword there's some things hidden with what other people have thrown away god is about to raise up some other people said you ain't gonna be nothing she ain't never gonna they threw you away and said you are not gonna amount to nothing but in the midst of what they threw away god says i'm about to raise you up when they disqualify you and said god ain't with you god says you're just now a candidate see the more people disqualify you the more you become a candidate for God's anointed the more they say God's not going to use you the more God has a bad habit of blessing people that other people think he shouldn't bless because he likes to let the world know that I'm the Lord that chooses I'm the Lord that anoints I'm the Lord that calls I'm the Lord that appoints men and I don't look on their outward appearance I try their heart that's how come David could write about the secret place there's some secret places, places that other people have looked over. Don't you know when the Bible says that, that, that Jeremiah the prophet was thrown down in a pit in a cistern? You know what a cistern was? That's the sewer. They threw Jeremiah in a sewer. The king did and wanted to kill him because he was prophesying judgment. And the Bible says, Abedmelech, which in the Hebrew means servant of the king, who was an Ethiopian eunuch, came along. And the Bible says he took the dirty rags that were under the temple and tied them together and was able to get Jeremiah out of the pit. Dirty rags, what other people threw away, he saw as a thing, as a symbol of salvation. See, what other people throw away. I get excited when people say, you know, you ain't gonna amount to nothing. 
I said, praise God. <laughs> keep, keep telling me more. Keep talking about me. I went through such a warfare last year. And I thought, my, I, thought I said, God, this, this ain't nothing but the devil. I said, now, Lord, you just open the door for me. Now you're going to slam it in my face. I had a crazy person going all over the country. You know who I'm talking about. All over the country attacking me. Just talking about my, my character and stuff. And I just knew doors were closed. And they kept going. They went to Jake's. They went to all this, these people telling them stuff. And before I knew it, dead door. They, people started telling me, said, they can't come back here no more. We know your anointing. They can't come back. Now, would you preach at manpower? I said, I'd be more than happy. <laughs> See, they thought they were destroying. And while they were trying to destroy me, God was just setting me up. I mean, I was getting free publicity. And people were, people were calling me, didn't even know me. said, look, we heard some stuff. And we just wanted to know. And I said, well, it's all a lie. Well, then would you come preach? I said, praise God. I never even heard of you until they mentioned it. And I got one of your tapes. And I said, this guy kind of anointed. I want to know if what they said is really true. And then they said, it's a lie. But now at least I got the tape. And you pretty good. Come to our conference. I said, I couldn't pay for publicity like this. Said, come on, it's free publicity. I sent him a letter. I was going to have my lawyer send a letter, a cease and desist letter. I said, oh, no, let him keep on going. <laughs> I mean, every, every place they went to and told, said that I would, and tried to tell people so I wouldn't come, now I'm invited. Every single door that they thought they were shutting, I'm now preaching in. Every single one. They were all on TBN talking about stuff to Paul and Jan. They got so in interested, they called Carlton Pearson and said, look, we heard you have this guy at your church. Send us one of the tapes. They watched one of my tapes, asked for a biography. Sent the biography. They said, never in all our life have we heard so much revelation come out of one person. They said, where did you? They said, I don't, we don't get him on TBN. So now I'm booked to go on TBN three times this year. Do you understand what God's doing in your life when people begin to attack you and try to destroy you and try to defile you and try to fight? That all they're doing is setting you up for a blessing every time they fight you, every time they try to come against you. They are positioning you for spiritual authority. They are positioning you for the purpose and the plan of God. Listen, I'm almost finished with my first point. No, 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 I'm almost finished for real. Here I am, I'm an Orthodox bishop. That means you go to my church on Sunday, it's different. Orthodox, like Greek Orthodox, Russian. I'm Orthodox. Now I'm, I'm, I, I'm charismatic, I'm spirit-filled, I speak in tongues, and I've experienced the power of the Holy Spirit, but I don't belong. I mean, I don't fit in. But you know, but that's what God likes to do. He just likes to get, Bishop Pearson was on, on TBN a couple weeks ago, and he was saying, and they were saying, Who, who's going to preach at Azusa this year? And he said, well, Dr. Carolyn Showell's going to be there, Liston, Liston Page is going to be there, Michael Pitts is going to be there, all these different, you know, speakers and stuff, uh, Miles Monroe, and, and, and then he said, oh yeah, we have Bishop Ash. And, and he says, oh, I've never heard of him. He said, Bishop Ash, he's a Syrian Orthodox bishop. Syrian or Are they even saved? <laughs> Said, oh yeah, this is this man come up there speaking in tongues with a robe on and cross big enough to put Jesus on it. It's a <laughs> when it's your day, when it's your time, when it's your season, man of God, when it's your season, woman of God, when it's your season. There's nothing they can, all they do, everything, that is, it's all a positioning. And what seems like an attack is a divine setup positioning you to get where God wants you to be. Let me, I got to finish real quick. I got to finish because they put the clock back on and gave me, it went to zero and they gave me another 30 minutes. God, I like you. Whoever, whoever came in, you my best friend. Bless you. You get a free videotape with, from their church. They're going to pay for it. Listen here. It's Friday night. You ain't got nowhere to go, you know. You know in the world you were just getting dressed. You was trying to find somebody. You want to go out tonight? Even you're trying to get there before the last call <clears throat> here comes David watch this man David goes through all of this process strip deals, deals with all of these issues Saul tries to kill him Saul tries to kill him can't kill him can't kill him can't kill him Jonathan now the Bible says that because Jonathan could not differentiate from being David's friend and Saul's son and sometimes we get stuck between the old move of God and the fresh move of God and the Bible says when Jonathan died, when Saul died, Jonathan died with him. And David grieved for him and loved him more than a man loves a woman.
See, some of the people that you care about the most are the people that are going to be unwilling to go with you. And you have to go, let me, let me encourage you, you have to go when no one goes. You have to be faithful over the things that God tells you to be faithful over, even if no one's ever done it before, even if no one's ever been there before, even if no one has ever experienced it, you have to do it. You have to be faithful and say, God, you told me to do this. Sometimes, you know, you're always, the problem in the church is we're always waiting for a confirmation. Sometimes you just need to know what God told you. Sometimes you need to just say, you know what, I'm, I, I know what God told me, and now I'm going to be faithful over what God told me to do. I'm going to stretch out my faith and experience God. I'll never forget first miracle I ever got. First time. I was a young evangelist. I was about 15 years old. And I was running a revi- few little revivals, you know, because it was uh, 15. And that was exciting, you know, bring little, little evangelists in and let them preach, you know. So I was here and I'm running little revivals and stuff. And I, next, I got bold because I had watched, you know, all these guys on TV. And I just thought if they could do it, I could do it. And I told them, said, bring the sick. Bring the sick. And I mean, tomorrow night, God's going to give me healing. I'm going on a fast. And I was serious. I wasn't playing too. And I went on a fast. I said, bring him. And next night, I went into the church. And I was all excited. I was prayed up, man. We're going to pray for the sick tonight. And I came in, and it was nine wheelchairs. And I told the pastor, I said, said bring the sick, not the cripple. <laughs> I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to work my way up. Y'all going to... This ain't nothing but the devil. I, mean, I went back. I said, I got to go back and pray. Hold on. Sing, keep singing for another 20 minutes. I got to get a hold of God. Here I am all disturbed. I was worried. I said, Lord. I said, line them up. I preach like a madman. I said, line them up. I said, God, God can do this. Line them up, man. I said, line them up. I just preach like a madman on faith too, and they just lined up the people all up. I mean, they were praying like, "Whoa, this is gonna be God!" And I just, boy, I just, in the name of Jesus, I snatched the foot, kicked the wheelchair. I said, "Go, shit, walk!" And I moved to the next one. As I moved to the next one, I, boom! And I looked back, and they just hit the floor, bam! I said, "One down, eight to go." I snatched the next one up. I said, God said walk. And I whispered in there. I said, please try. Please try to walk. Take a step. I let go. Boom, 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 boom. They was on, that one fell on the other one. I said, Lord, get them all. I said, okay. Six more to go. And I did this four people. Now, by this time, I'm on the fourth one. I mean, they've fallen on each other. The pastor, by this time, is walking toward me. Because he's trying to eat like, you poor fool. He's going to come and encourage me and say, leave it alone. And by this time, I just fall on my knees. And I'm just, I'm really broken in my spirit. Because I said, God, you're not doing it. He said, I don't do it for you. I do it for me. And just with all humility, I said, God, do this not for my fame, but for your glory. And while I was praying on the knees of this other person, the fifth person, while I was praying... I felt them just, just, and this person stood up, had never walked, or had not walked in 10 years, was in a major, had a spinal injury, had not walked in 10 years, and for the first time in 10 years, they stood up. See, had I stopped at the second person, had I stopped at the third person, you understand what I'm saying? See, I, when you know God told you to do something, even if you do not see the immediate results that you expect, you continue to press, you continue to believe God, you continue to stay faithful, sometimes you do what God told you to do. Jonathan lost it because he was unwilling to go with David. He was unwilling to take a risk. Most people miss the move of God because they're unwilling to take risks. They're unwilling to step out and try something new. They're unwilling to become radical and lose everything. They're more concerned about their reputation, what people think and what people say, than what God has said. Let me get to where I'm going. So in the midst of all of this now, David ascends to the throne. The Bible says that he is now anointed king over all of Judah. And eventually he's king over all of Israel. And the first thing David does, and this is why God honors David so greatly. The first thing David does is he inquires of the Lord. And he says, where is the Ark of the Covenant? First thing. See, whenever, whenever God blesses you, the first thing you need to ask is where is his presence in all of this? 
That the first question, where is God's presence? When God does something for you, where is God's presence? Where is God in all of this? Find God in all of it. David now sets up the kingdom of God. And the Bible says that in the process, he goes and sends them and says, go get the kingdom. Go get the Ark of the Covenant. They put it on some animals. And as they're bringing it on the banks of, of, of animals, because the last time that the Philistines took it, they sent it back on the backs of dumb oxen. And they sent it in. See, that's us. Like many of us believe that, that programs bring the presence of God. We believe that you, know, you have enough programs, youth ministry, children's ministry, singing ministry, single ministry, divorce ministry, want to be married ministry, used to be married, need to be married ministry. You know, all type of ministries. We believe that brings God's presence. That doesn't bring God's presence. It is the weight of God's presence that's brought on the shoulders of men and women when they praise and worship to bring God. So in the midst of this here, they do. They stand up and they say, let us bring the presence of God. And they stand up and as they're bringing God's presence, he say, or as the presence is coming on the back of these animals, the Bible says that it falls when it comes to the threshing floor. And the very prophetic symbol because the threshing floor is where wheat is beaten to remove the husk so that the pure kernel of wheat can be released the outside is the same shape as the seed inside it looks like wheat but it's not the real wheat the real wheat is hidden within it and it's not released till it's brought to the threshing floor and broken on it see some of you are being brought to the threshing floor because you look like the church and you got the outside appearance together and God says I gotta break off that mold that thing that you built up that looks like it but it's a rock hard and it doesn't have anything precious within it I've got to remove that to release the seed that that's within you that's been hidden the gift the anointing but it's all surrounded by the walls that you built up to protect you from being hurt because you've seen so many false people so many fake prophets so many fake preachers so many people that are manipulated and abused so that now you built up this wall and you won't let anything come close to you because you think you know everything and you're just trying to be safe but God says I will bring you to the threshing floor to break it open to get to the kernel to the fresh anointing that's been lying on the inside the Bible says that the ark of the covenant falls and as it falls a young man by the name of Uzzah stretches forth his hand and when he stretches forth his hand the Bible says that he is struck dead immediately now this is sincere he should have been blessed he's trying to help the presence of God and doesn't want it to fall and the Bible says the place is called Paras Uzzah or Perez Uzzah which means the the breach of Uzzah why did Uzzah stretch forth his hand you know why because Uzzah was raised in the house of Obed-Edom Obed-Edom was where the Ark of the Covenant was the Bible says that the Ark of the Covenant was in the house of Obed-Edom until David went and brought it from there so as a kid he was raised up around this uh, Ark of the Covenant. As a kid, he played marbles next to it. As a kid, he had always been close to it. So he had gotten common with it. So when it was fallen, he had gotten so common with what was precious, he thought he could put his human hand to what was divine and supernatural because he had been around it so much. And sometimes we've been around the anointing so much. We've been around the presence of God. We've been around praise and worship. We've been around tongues. We've been around prophecy. We've been around prophets and apostles. We've been around the men and women of God that we get common with them. And when we get common with them, we die because we cannot receive the life that they have to offer us because we get too common with them. Do you understand when God told Elijah or Elisha asked Elijah, said, what do you want from me? He says, I want a double portion of your spirit. You remember the story? What does Elijah say? You have asked a hard thing. Remember that? Yeah. And then what does he say? He says this. He says, if you see me when I'm caught up, then you can receive it. Now, I never understood that, never, until January this, this year. I said, what do you mean if when you're caught up, that's, then you'll get it? Why couldn't you just give it to him? And, Elijah, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, let me tell you why. Elisha lived with Elijah for seven years. For seven years, he had gotten used to Elijah. He knew that if Elijah didn't brush his teeth, his breath stank just like his. He realized that Elijah was a man just like him. He had gotten so used to the man Elijah that Elijah, the man, could not impart nothing to him. So he had to see Elijah in a spiritual revelation. And if he saw Elijah from a heavenly realm, then the Elijah from the heavenly could impart to him. Do you understand what this keeps you from receiving the anointing in the men of God's lives? It's because sometimes you see him here instead of seeing him caught up. You see him from an earthly realm instead of a heavenly realm. And if you see us in a heavenly realm, we can't impart nothing to us. But if you see us in a spiritual realm, in a heavenly realm, if you see us in a heavenly realm, we can impart to you. But if you see us in an earthly realm, we cannot impart. Because in an earthly realm, Varan doesn't have anything to give to you. Varan ain't got nothing to offer you. But God's prophet has a lot to impart. The Joneses don't have nothing to impart to you. 
But the prophet and the apostle, the pastor and the woman of God have an anointing on their life. The apostolic and prophetic dimension have an anointing on their life that can impart to you. But if you're trying to receive from the Joneses, you ain't going to get nothing. Because you're coming with them. And you may die touching what God has called sacred. I'm almost finished with my second point. No, I'm concluding right now. The Bible says that Uzzah's killed. David gets more information, finds out about the due order, and says, let's bring God's presence. They bring it into the place. Bring it in. And when it's coming, here comes the presence of God. And the Bible says, as it's being brought in, David goes dancing in front of God's presence. And the Bible says, David danced till he was clothed with a linen ephod. We taught that David danced till he was naked. No, that's not. First of all, that's unfit. You let somebody try to get, praise God that much in here and see how far they'll get. <laughs> it's, that's not befitting the dignity of God's presence. God would have never allowed that. The problem was David was a king. And kings were not allowed to get close to God's presence. They were supposed to rule the gen they were, their job was to rule the people but David didn't want to be a king David just wanted to be close to God and so David put on you know what a linen ephod is that's what priests wear so David put on a disguise and said listen if I could just get close to God and David went to leaping and dancing with the linen ephod and the priest see the priest had known if the priest knew he was the king they would have never let him get close because they loved David too and they didn't want God to kill him. But David's heart was so pure that when he put on the linen ephod and began to dance and praise God, as he was dancing and coming in God's presence, the Bible says that he was clothed in the linen ephod so that he could get closer because a king was not allowed to get that close. And why didn't God kill? Why did God get mad with Saul for the same thing? Because when Saul did it, Saul did it so the people could see that he had stepped out of his anointing. David genuinely just wanted to be close to God and what David was saying was hey when you met me when you called me to be king I was called worshiping and if I'm gonna be a king I've got to first be a worshiper and that will qualify my kingdom that will qualify the authority that you give me. so here comes David skipping and dancing and the Bible says that they brought gifts and there was a threefold portion of God's anointing a triple portion of what God had as he brought the glory of God and in the midst of all of this Michael and this is where I'm finishing. I'm not even going to break a sweat. It's that, that word of faith anointing up on here this week got me just more dignified so I don't work so hard. This is what happens here. Michael, Saul, and the Bible says when you read it, the Bible says Michael, Saul's daughter. Now remember Saul is already dead. Michael, Saul's daughter, despised David in her heart. It shouldn't have read Michael, Saul's daughter. You know what it should have read? Michael, David's wife. But she was so busy being a princess. See, she had been raised in the, in the, in the palace. She had been raised as a king. So she, why am I going to be down there? With the, he, doesn't he know he's a king? I married this country bumpkin. He don't even know how to act like a king. He's down there acting like a priest. In her mind, priests were lesser than kings. The king was the most important in her mind because she was the king's daughter. So she was so busy trying to be the king's daughter, she couldn't be David's wife. And you know how the Bible, what the Bible says God did to her? He closed up her womb. Because people who do not worship cannot produce. Because God will not let you produce. A, because you know what? You would produce your own kind and God will not let you produce an ungrateful generation that will not seek after the things of God this is a generation that if we're going to tap God we're going to tap him through praise and worship we're going to tap him when we come into a realm of dignity the like of which we have never seen before when we get into the presence of God we're not going to be like Michael and despise the move of God we may not always understand it there's a lot of things I'm so desperate for God's presence 
I am desperate for God's presence. And there's a lot of things I don't understand. I have some very good friends that were connected with the Toronto blessing, and I didn't understand it. And I told them, I said, man, I don't understand all of that laughing. I don't understand it, all that barking and roaring. I don't understand it. But let me tell you this, I'm not going to despise it. Because if God is in it, see, I, I, I know we want to discuss theology and is it accurate and is it not. Sometimes, it, sometimes the move of God transcends theology. Sometimes the move of God goes beyond everything that is planned for and everything that has been, you know, within our agenda. Sometimes the move of God goes, is greater than all of that. And sometimes when you're hungry and desperate for the things of God, you've got to break beyond the religious tradition of your day and press into the fresh move of God. You've got to press into a place you've never pressed into before. You've got to find a place in prayer. You've got to find a place. And let me tell you that there's some Davids in here tonight. There are some Davids who have been frustrated because you know that there's more. You know there's another realm. You know there's another place in God. And you've been stuck. And some of you are dealing with the issue because you've got some Michaels in your life. You've got some people that are so connected to trying to maintain their dignity. Trying to look a certain way. Trying to act a certain way. And you're, and you're trying to... And, and you don't know. Am I supposed to be desperate? Or am I supposed to act like I have it together? Sometimes you can't get a move of God till you just act like you don't have it together sometimes you got to act like you are losing your mind sometimes when you really want the presence of god you got to just loosen your tie kick off your ferragamo shoes and say you know what this ain't about being cute this is about getting in god's presence sometimes you so desperately have to say you know what i'm so sick of just doing the same thing eight week after week service after service i'm desperate i'm willing to try something i've never tried i'm willing to praise the way i've never prayed i'm willing to get on my back fall on my face cry roll whatever it takes to get a hold of god the, the question today is are you going to be that david are you going to appear now see the problem is most of you you can't be david till you get now you want to be david in the future because you are unwilling to risk what you have secured in your present moment but you will not get the anointing that god has for you until you are able to stop putting off tomorrow what God wants you to operate in today stop believing for and start believing from and start telling God this is my hour this is my moment this is my day this is my anointing I've been faithful and I'm ready to walk in the greater measure that you have for me I'm not going to stay where I am I'm moving to the next level because I am hungry and desperate for the move of God touch your neighbor and say I am desperate for the move of God touch somebody else and say I am desperate for the move of God Brother, we got some Michaels that, that are looking at you. There are people that are watching you to see what you're going to do. There are some people that when you tell them I'm going to be successful, when you tell them the anointing is going to come on you, they're looking for you to fail. They're looking for you to make a mistake. They're looking for you to mess up. They're looking for you, but you got to be like David and say, look, at, you know what made what saved David's life? David said, it ain't about being king. It's about getting close to God's presence. It's not about a title. It's about his presence. See, some of us are so busy trying to worry about, I want to be a bishop. I want to be this. I want to be... It's not about that. It's about getting close to God. God. It's about getting into the presence of God and say, whatever it costs me, I don't care if I lose my position, if I lose my title, I don't care if I'm laughed at, I don't care if you don't take me seriously, all I want is the presence of God. Tell your neighbor, all I want is the presence of God. How many of you really believe that today? How many of you, all you want is the presence of God? There's coming a David generation, an eighth generation. There's coming a move of God, the like of which we have never seen before. There's coming a people of God in this hour that are going to tell God, God, if you're going to use someone, it's going to be me in this day. I'm hungry for the move of God. I'm desiring the move of God. I can't stay where I am. God, it's my turn. It's my hour. It's my chance. There's got to be more than church. There's got to be more than religion. There's got to be more than Sunday school. There's got to be more than choir and Bible study. God, I want a greater anointing than what I have. I want a greater outpouring than what I'm desiring. So David, the Bible says that David, David who was a king, was also a worshiper. David who was a king established. And the Bible says in the Old Testament and in the book of Acts that God will rebuild not the temple of Solomon, not the tabernacle of Moses, but God will reestablish the tabernacle of David. You know why David's tabernacle was greater than the temple? Because because the temple only the Jews could come in and you had to come through different dimensions but in David's tabernacle it was open for anybody to worship in David's tabernacle anybody could come and anybody could acknowledge and anybody could glorify and anybody could examine and anyone could praise this is a generation when people that we have rejected if people said you ain't gonna amount to nothing if they told you you ain't nobody if they told you you ain't going nowhere I got news for you tonight you are set up for God to use you you're set up for God to anoint you your hour is coming you get ready
ready to be anointed. You get ready for a dedication. You get ready for God's presence because you've been faithful. Stand up on your feet. Faithful, faithful.